Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Well, those of you who've been counting, and you should have been counting, from the wave sheaf offering during the Days of Unleavened Bread till now, would know that today is day 35 in our count to Pentecost. And Pentecost is a pivotal, is one of the, you know, all of God's holy days are pivotal. They all have such deep meaning. But I think in one sense we can think of Pentecost as a very pivotal point in God's plan. Because, of course, we know that Pentecost was the day, anciently, that God confirmed his covenant with, with uh, Israel at Sinai with the giving of the law on the tablets of stone. And we know that it was the confirmation of his covenant, the new, the, what's called we call the new covenant, on Pentecost in A.D. 30, around there, with the giving of the Holy Spirit and our receiving the law on tablets of flesh, on our hearts. So the giving of the Holy Spirit, I think, in, its, in, this, in this sense, in this pouring out on Pentecost, was a pivotal point. Now, of course, when we think about the Holy Spirit, we find that the Holy Spirit is a stumbling block for many people. Brother Ray was just discussing with me an encounter he had here recently where a lady was questioning him on whether he believed in the Trinity. Of course, what she was trying to get him to say was what he thought of the Holy Spirit. And Ray, being the wise and discerning man that he is, avoided the, in confronting the woman directly, which was because he didn't want, in, a, uh, in the situation he was in, did not want a confrontation. But we do find that the Holy Spirit is a stumbling block for many people. And the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit in so many different ways, and understanding it can become jumbled, quite frankly, misleading, and it also happens when people latch onto a small or select set of biblical statements about the Spirit and then try to massage that into a complete description. So how can we describe the Holy Spirit? How should we describe the Holy Spirit? Well, we can say the Holy Spirit is the creative power and energy of the God family. We can say that the Holy Spirit is the nature, life, and mind of the God family. We can say that the Holy Spirit is the power and active energy of life, both temporary and eternal. Now, I use the phrase God family since the Holy Spirit is presented to us as the Spirit of God, that is, the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son, hence the God family. The Spirit is the very power by which God created all things, first of all. We should understand that. Let's look at Jeremiah 32, 17. Jeremiah 32, 17. Notice what it says here. It says, Jeremiah 32, 17, Oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power, and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too difficult for you. So by God's power, everything was created, the heavens and the earth. And in other words, the totality of everything was created by your power. So what is that power? Let's look at Psalm 104, verse 30. Psalm 104, verse 30. And we'll answer that question. It says here in Psalm 104, verse 30, You send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. So we see that God's spirit is the power by which he created all things. 
We also see that it's by God's Spirit that He can be present everywhere in the universe. Look at Psalm 139, and you're in Psalms. You're not, if you're still there, go to Psalm 139 and look at verse 7. Psalm 139, verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol or the grave, behold, you are there. So God's presence, he's saying here in essence, is everywhere. There is nowhere you can go to escape the presence of the living God. Notice also Jeremiah 23, 23. Jeremiah 23, 23. This is God speaking here, so this should tell us something. Jeremiah 23, 23. Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him? He must be chuckling when he says that. <laughs> do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? In other words, he's saying here his presence is, it fills the universe. And how big is the universe? Well, <laughs> in fact, I would go, to, I would be bold enough to say it goes beyond the universe because the universe is a created thing. God created the universe as large as it is. And the Holy Spirit proceeds from God and fills this entire universe. So God may be present within every nook and cranny of the universe, but he is still separate from the universe. He's as separate as a distinct being, and the universe, of course, is something he created. So he's outside that. He's bigger than the universe. So now we can establish that the Holy Spirit is the power that God, by which God created everything. Now the question might come to mind, so how, how did God use his spirit power to create? Well, let's look at Psalm 33. Psalm 33. <clears throat> and let's start with verse 6. Of Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. Notice this. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathers the water of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke... And it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. And brethren, if we think back to Genesis and the creation account, given in Genesis 1 through 1, 1, 1 through 113, we can see that every place God said, God spoke, and it was so. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let there be an expanse above the, you know, the seas. And let the seas, and God said, and God said, and God said. So what I'm trying to point out here, brethren, is the God family speaks, and stuff just happens. The member of the God family who later became Jesus Christ is known as the Word. And with good reason. Because it was he who spoke that word. He was the word of God. And we know, we know that John, well, very well. John, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So the being that spoke these words... And things and stuff happened was none other than the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. You can draw no other conclusion from this. And, and go on in verse 14 of John 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. 
Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, it's interesting that only begotten of the Father, they used to believe that the, the only begotten, that sounds like he's the only Son of God. But the only be, because they thought that the word came from monogeneo, which means only or begotten, is what it means. Later scholars have seen other the, uh, texts, ancient texts, which show that it should be monogenes, genes, which means the unique, the unique son of God. Because the, in, in Hebrews where it talks that Isaac was the only begotten of Abraham, well, we know that Abraham had Ishmael, so he clearly wasn't the only son of Abraham. But what we have is Jesus Christ is the unique son of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the word of God. He is the one who spoke, and it was. So what are words? If we're thinking of God, uh, Jesus Christ as being the word of God, what are words? Well, words are sources of information. And they're also expressions of the will of the one speaking. As human beings created in God's image, we use language in the same way. We use it to, example, transmit information or express our will. For example, the cat is black. That's information. Go feed the cat. That's what I want you to do. I'm expressing my will. So the universe is constructed on the basis of information. Math, gravity, light, light waves. And the universe is constructed on the basis of God's will, his purpose, his plans, his goals. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We'll start with verse 2. In these last days, he, meaning uh, days, speaking of God, he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The same power which creates also sustains all things, brethren, and keeps them running. Therefore, God must be present and engaged in his creation. You know, the ancient, uh, the, there, there was a, 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 a mode of thought called theism which many of uh, the founding fathers actually were theists, like George, uh, George Washington, I think Thomas, and Thomas Jefferson were theists, who believed that God was basically, yes, there was a God, and God did create, and he created it. His creation was like a clock that he wound up and set it in motion and then stepped back and just, I guess, watched. But that's not the way God is, brethren. That's not the way he's presented in Scripture. The universe is not like a clock God wound up and left him to run on his own. Although God, through Christ, made you as you are now, atoms, molecules, organs, systems, it's truly, you know, the more you learn about the human body, the more in awe you'll become. I mean, that's my, been my experience. But through Christ, God made you as you are, and God wants to work with you on a higher level of creation. And this higher level involves the same awe-inspiring creative power used to create the universe. Do you realize that? The very same power that God created the universe, he's using to create, in essence, a new you, a new me. But also... Our act of engagement and cooperation is necessary. See, God, 
That's not doing this by fiat. He's not making us robots. We are involved. So the Bible also speaks of the Holy Spirit as an act of power at work within human beings. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 1. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we'll look at verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Here is the Holy Spirit, the act of power, rather, of the Holy Spirit doing more than upholding and sustaining the atoms, molecules that make up our body. The power of the inner spirit of the Spirit is interacting with our minds. The power of the Spirit is interacting with our minds. But this active engagement of the human mind and the Holy Spirit isn't happening in everyone right now. For now it's only at work in those who accept God's calling and enter into the new covenant with Him. So why isn't God's Spirit available to everyone now? Or why isn't it accessible to everyone now? Well, let's look at Genesis 2 verse 8, and we'll see why. Genesis 2 verse 8. It says, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice that the tree of life here, brethren, notice that the tree of life is available for them to eat if they wanted. God didn't say, don't eat of this. He only said, don't eat of the tree of good and not of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of, the tree of life was open to them. The tree of life represents the Holy Spirit. God doesn't just automatically give the Holy Spirit to human beings as part of being born. Receiving the Holy Spirit is not a passive transaction. One, the person has to want it. And two, the person has to cooperate and work with God. And in the case of Adam and Eve, it was just a simple, a simple uh, case of uh, choice to obey. <coughs> if, and it's a great big if, Adam and Eve had chosen the tree of life, they could have received the Holy Spirit, which would have given them spiritual discernment, knowledge, ability to understand and apply the instruction God had given them, and that he would continue to give them. In essence, they would have true knowledge. They would be growing and developing the mind of God, which is the way of peace, joy, fulfillment, contentment, cooperation, and concern for others. Furthermore, the Holy Spirit would have been planted in them the power that energizes eternal life. The same power that created the vast, awe-inspiring universe. When they were ready, they would have experienced the transformation of their mortal bodies into spirit-composed members of God's family. Alas, they chose poorly. Why? Why did they choose? I mean, well... The first reason is deception. God allows our alternative theories of reality and the purpose of life to freely flow into the mix of the material universe. He allows false information to float around as well as truth. And he allows expressions of an ill will as well as good. And all this serves God's purpose for us. Because we are aware of the options that are out there, we must make a choice. God's giving us a choice. 
It's like when in Deuteronomy he says, I set before you today life and death. Therefore, choose life. We must make choices, and we must take our stand. All of this gives God the opportunity to see what we're made of. But God, being perfectly righteous, truthful, and good, cannot, will not, and is not the one to spread false information. Satan, by his own choice, does the dirty work of promoting alternative theories of life and reality, thereby forcing us to make a choice, make our stand, reveal our heart. So that was the, well, that's one reason they made the bad decision, deception. The other one, frankly, is apathy or laziness. Laziness, apathy, Pick, take your choice. Look at 1 Timothy 2.14. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Okay, so Eve at least was deceived. But Adam's disobedience was different. He knew the lie was a lie. But he went along with it anyway. He went with the flow. He went the easy way. Because he was passive. He was either lazy or he was apathetic. So that's another way to choose poorly. So, brethren, the record in Genesis shows that in the beginning, God gave humanity instruction and good information. You may eat all of these, all of these, including the tree of life. But not that. The one thing you don't touch. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it reminds me of, you tell a kid, you could have all these cookies over here, but don't you touch that cookie. What's a kid going to do every time? You going to pick up that <laughs> What? I don't. <laughs> Humanity decided to make their own decisions about what was the right way to live. What was right versus wrong, what is good versus evil. They decided it would take upon themselves God's prerogative, in essence making themselves God, to decide what was good and what was evil. They would sift through the good information and the bad information and make up their own mind. And how's that worked out for us? Occasionally, <laughs> and it, this is this boggles my mind, especially in this country. But we'll find these groups that pop up and saying they actively and openly worship Satan. And we've seen this. We've seen them erect statutes in courthouses, I mean, in, in public places, because they say there are other religious things there, and so they get away with it. And if you ask, ask them about their why they why they worship Satan, you might get some answer that, like this. Well, we worship Satan because he sets us free, free from boundaries and restrictions we never agreed to and don't want. <laughs> and in one way, shape, or form, this is simply a more brash statement of the approach most humanity has taken toward God and his instructions. They don't want to be told what to do. We're smart. We'll figure things out on our own. That's what their decision, that decision in the garden set in motion. Self-reliance and self-confidence are mostly regarded as positive approaches, but they also create a problem. Because without the creative, life-giving power of God's Holy Spirit, without that, 70, 80 years, how much ever you've got, you're done. That's it. Without God's Spirit, 
That's all there is, folks. Humanity's answer to this problem is to construct an alternate reality for themselves. It's as if they say, we won't really be dead. Our immortal soul will still be alive. To that, God says, no, it won't. Or they may say, they may say, there's nothing beyond death anyway. We might as well do as we please. God says, that's one of the options you can choose. Let's look at Genesis 3.22. Let's see what happens after that fateful decision in the garden. Genesis 3:22. <clears throat> then the Lord God said, "Behold, the man has become like one of us." In other words, taken upon themselves to be like us, to, to decide knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. <coughs> Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at, and, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. And you don't need to turn there, but for your reference, just write down Isaiah 59, 2. Isaiah 59, 2. I'm just going to read that. But Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. So that's why God's, the access to the Holy Spirit isn't just open to everyone. You see, man has cut himself off from the tree of life. God has cut himself off from God's, from access to God the Father through their sins. But God has a plan, you see. God has a plan to reopen access to the Holy Spirit, and he's going to do that. He has done that through the second Adam, the second Adam. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15:45. We'll see about this second, this second Adam. The first Adam, we, we recall, made the, the wrong choice. And the consequences have played out through the millennia. But God's plan has calls for a second Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. What would happen if a human being did not choose poorly? If he, she did not rely on their own human mind and accepted, simply accepted the good information and the good will of God? <clears throat> it's through Christ, brethren, through the Messiah, that second Adam, the door has opened up and access to the Holy Spirit is now available to all who will claim it. Through acceptance of his sacrificial death as payment for their sins and the cleansing of the conscience through his blood, human beings can be cleaned up and may once again come into God's presence. Remember, it's our it's sin that's keeping us from our access to God and since the second Adam, Jesus Christ, takes away that sin. We now have access to God the Father. And by access to God the Father, we now have access 
to the tree of life. However, this process still requires you and I to cooperate and work with God. Only those who respond to the calling of God will be chosen to receive the Holy Spirit. See, many are called, but few choose. Many hear God's word. The church has, you know, for all these years have been preaching in one form or another the true gospel of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. But how many who heard that and it just went right through over their heads? Or they heard it and they started maybe down the path when you know the parable of the sower and the seed. I, know, I won't go into it, but... The process begins with repentance. We as human beings have to admit we are wrong on just about everything. That we actually know nothing. We think we know a lot. But we know nothing. We do not know the way to live. We do not have life within us. And we need God if we want to continue to live. If we want eternal life. And God must give us that power, that, that spirit. Acts 2.38. <clears throat> Notice what it says in Acts 2.38. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice it's a gift. It's not something we earn. We don't earn it. We don't earn it by even by repentance we don't earn it by baptism we don't earn it by the by the laying on of hands it's a gift because there's nothing we can do to earn that gift but god looks on the heart and when he sees that heart of repentance when he sees that willingness to commit by the act of baptism, when he sees the act of faith in the laying on of hands, then he gives that gift. And what a gift it is. Notice Joel 2.28. Joel 2.28. This is, this is what Peter quotes in his sermon in Acts 2. <clears throat> it will come about after that, this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. That started at Pentecost. That was just though the down payment of what will come, brethren. During the millennium, and and at the and at the second resurrection <clears throat> after the millennium you see god's end game is that the holy spirit may be made possible accessible to all people but he's working in a plan to reopen access in stages you see god had already reintroduced himself to humanity prior to the coming of jesus christ you see, humanity had cut themselves off, but at the time of his choosing, God reestablished limited communications among humanity through the family of Abraham, that, and therefore, and thereafter Israel, after 2,000 years. The first phase of restoring access to the Holy Spirit was committed to was to commit, rather, the essential information about how to live a godly life to writing, confirm it by signs and wonders, reproduce and distribute hundreds of thousands of copies, and God used the nation of Israel to perform this task. Israel had the necessary information. They had the information, but they were missing one vital ingredient, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, there were some perhaps many, and I think it was many, 
in Israel who received God's Holy Spirit. This was, we might, when you hear, hear about the, the faithful remnant, the remnant of Israel, these were those, I believe, who did, who were faithful, who did have a heart that was already flesh, that God had given the Holy Spirit. But these were the exception and not the rule. Israel's covenant with God at that time did not include free access to the Holy Spirit. Good information, yes. Vital information, actually. Blessings for obedience, absolutely. <clears throat> but circumcision and animal sacrifice did not open access to the Holy Spirit. It couldn't. Access was very limited. Some had it, but there was no clearly defined process for laying claim to it. Israel had the truth. They had the information, but not the spirit. And we understand that God wants both. God wants both. Jot down John 4.24. John 4, 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. We have to have the information, yes, but that information is worthless without God's spirit. The second phase in reopening access of the Holy Spirit, well, it's the church of God, the church of God. You see, humanity at large was not offered access to the Holy Spirit and therefore eternal life because once we have the eternal spirit, brethren, uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit, we have that down payment. We have eternal life in us. As long as the Spirit of God is in you, Jesus Christ is in you through that Spirit, we are part of Jesus Christ. We are the body of Christ. We have eternal life. <clears throat> and we, but mankind wasn't offered this until Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And any person can now access the Holy Spirit. However, they cannot still, they still can't just walk up to the tree and pick the fruit. They gain access only through the doorway of Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's only through him that we have access. And to administer this access, Christ commissioned his church. He did that on Pentecost. When by the miracle of the, of, the, of the giving of tongues, he prepared a people to go forth and spread the God and the giving of the Spirit there and pouring out the Spirit on Pentecost. He, he was opening access not only to all who would repent and believe on Jesus Christ, but then he was commissioning these people, getting them ready, giving them the, the tools they needed to go out to the nations and preach the kingdom of God to the rest of the world. Now, it took them a little while to get, to get that message. And eventually, the apostle Paul, of course, we know, was commissioned as the apostle to the Gentiles. <clears throat> But that was where the door was open, brethren, at Pentecost. And that commissioning of the church. The church is, therefore, the vehicle through which Jesus disseminates the necessary info to all the people by the proclamation of the gospel, the good news. And, and, and from, from that, I'm not, I'm not just talking about distributing Bibles. I mean providing information and instructions to the meaning and application of what is written to help people understand the scriptures and what they mean, to help people understand what the gospel truly is. The vehicle through which God extends his calling, choosing, and setting apart through godly living. Now, <clears throat> as you go around, you might find people who reject the church as serving any necessary role in the administration of God's Holy Spirit. They may say, I don't need you to administer the Holy Spirit. Or, clearly God's Spirit is already working with me. I'm seeking to obey Him. I've already started changing my life. I don't need the church. 
Well, the church and the ministry are not willfully inserting themselves between the believer and their God. But there is a task that God has given them to perform. Notice what he, the, well, you know, the, I don't need to, to, to uh, remind you the, the Great Commission in Matthew 28 19. Go therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the, thought, the, the, the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. The Holy Spirit is involved in convicting a person of their need to repent. You see, without that Holy Spirit working with us in the beginning, our minds can't even be open to understand the good news, the scriptures. Acts 5.32, Acts 5.32. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, which God has given to those who obey him. See, God gives the Spirit to open people's minds so that they can understand and make a, a, a well-informed choice. But that is something different than receiving the down payment and deposit of the power of everlasting life, which follows baptism. When the Holy Spirit indwells us, brethren, writes God's law in our hearts, empowers us to be able to follow God's will, not because we're trying to earn salvation, but because we love him, because he first loved us, because he died for us while we were yet sinners. We respond in obedience. Some evidence that a person has started the process of changing their life is actually one of the criteria we as the ministry look for in those seeking baptism. We're not looking for perfection. We'd look a long time. Just to start. Just a gen gesture of good faith. To help a person understand and count the cost. What this means. We also want to make sure the person has actually heard and believed the true gospel. It's a very simple transaction actually. Consider the example of Jesus, who himself was baptized. We remember that story. John said, in essence, and I'm paraphrasing here, Whoa, you don't need to be baptized by me. It should be the other way around. And Jesus answered, Go ahead and do it. In this way, we establish the pattern for what needs to be done. He said, All righteousness. This is what needs to be done. I'm showing the way. Jesus was baptized as an example for those who would follow. He certainly didn't need to be cleansed of sin. The only reason he was doing as it was we are to follow him. He is our master. He is, we are his disciples. We do what the master did. Repentance and uh, baptism are required steps for receiving the Holy Spirit and the doubt payment of eternal life. Now, we know there were some exceptions. Cornelius, for example, the Spirit was given to him. But these were signs so that thick-headed Peter would understand that God wasn't talking about eating unclean food when he saw that this was clear evidence. So... That was an exception. There are exceptions when the Holy Spirit has been given before this, but in general, the steps are receiving the Holy Spirit are repentance, baptism, and the laying on of hands. These are outward, outward signs signifying an inward change. And God will grant His Holy Spirit to those who have made demonstration by attitude and action that they have repented and want to enter the new covenant with him. Do these things and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts 2.38. This is a promise. The Peter here under, 
acting and speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, brethren, prophecies we have of the kingdom of God indicate there will be an even more extensive opening up of access to the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. We do not have a lot of details about that, but we do know that God's plan for creating many spirit-born children is marching forward and will continue to do so. But for now, you and I, well, we have our marching orders.